Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you all to Sunday school class this morning. Grateful for the goodness of God and the hand of God that has been so faithful to us all throughout the week. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have really been enjoying the Ono camp and the ministry of the Mark and Melody, the Sankeys. Um, if you missed that message last night, uh, Brother Spittler, are those messages recorded? They're not recorded. I wish that message last night could be broadcast throughout our churches. A beautiful message on making ourselves available by becoming followers of Jesus Christ. God has a plan. God has a plan. It just dovetails with the, with the lesson this morning. God has a plan. God is working on his plan. And God is often much slower than what we want his plan to unfold. But he's right on time. Right on time. Followers of Jesus Christ, and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Beautiful truth last night. And I want to say, too, we... Uh, Appreciate the leadership of the Spittlers at the camp. Uh, that's a big load. There's a lot of work that we don't see that goes into that. Brother Spittler, Sister Spittler, we appreciate your, your leadership. Thank you. If you would take your hymnals and turn to 571. 571, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, how we need it.
Lord is our rock. The Lord is our shelter in the time of storm. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. We'd like to go before the Lord in prayer. Are there any prayer requests on your heart you would like to share? Remember Sister Bell. All right. Pray for Sister Bell. Any others? There's quite a number of prayer requests in the bulletin this morning. Let's be remembering these needs and praying for these needs. Pray that the Spirit of God will open His Word to us this morning and throughout the day as the Word is ministered. Would you bow your heads for prayer, please? And let's just lift up, lift together and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts through his word. Father in heaven, we call upon you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that we can enter into your presence knowing that our sins are forgiven and that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. We can come with confidence, and we do, Father, not in our own merits, but in the merits that we find in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask, O oh God, that you would open your word to our understanding this morning. We thank you that you're our defense. We thank you that you're a sure rock that is unmovable. And that in the face of every storm, every, every battle, of every assault of the powers of darkness, that we can look to you and know that you, O oh God, have a plan that you're unfolding and that you're working out. We glorify you. Lord Jesus, we invite you into our midst this morning. Come here, Lord. Open your word to our understanding. We ask that the Spirit of God, your Holy Spirit, would come here and minister to our hearts and give us insight. And what we need, Lord, as fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in the Lord, as a family of God, to minister together to hearts we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What is the title of the lesson?
course of the lesson, but let the Holy Spirit minister whatever truth he wants to minister to your heart as we go through his word. His, his word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Just a couple of comments before we get started. You and I today are engaged in a spiritual warfare. We tend to become so engaged or engrossed in just living life and all of the demands of life that it's very easy to forget or to lose sight of the fact that this life is, is really not about so much about the temporal things that we were so taken up with. It's a spiritual warfare for men's souls. That's what the church is doing. The church is engaged in the spiritual warfare. Now, I'm not advocating this morning that we find a demon or a devil behind every bush. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you and I, as sanctified Christians, filled with the Spirit, God is calling us out, as he did Esther and Mordecai, in a spiritual warfare with the powers of darkness. And he has provided the resources and the equipment that we need to overcome. Praise the Lord. And to me, that's one of the great lessons of this story that we're studying this morning. Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not, we're not warring against each other, brothers and sisters. We're not warring against each other. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers and dark, uh, dark of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is war. The Christian life is war. It's war. But we're not fighting it in our own strength. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The glory of the beauty of this warfare that we're engaged in is that we have an unseen and oftentimes a silent defender that exceeds, infinitely exceeds in power the enemy that you and I face. And you notice I said sometimes a silent defender. We don't always see God at work. We can't always see what he's doing, but we we can know with assurance that God is at work and that he is unfolding his plan in your life and in my life and that God is almighty and all-powerful and sovereign in carrying out his divine purpose for this generation, in our generation. And if we'll cooperate with him and if we'll work together, God will do great and mighty things through us in the midst of this spiritual warfare. Well... In the lesson this morning, the Jews had been released from Babylon. Now, this is Persia, and, and King Ahasuerus uh, had exceeded mightily in his, in his rulership. In fact, the Bible tells us that his reign went from, from Ethiopia, which is eastern Africa, where I was born and grew up, clear over to India. That's huge. That is huge. And so he was a mighty emperor, a mighty ruler. And the, the Jews had been released to go back to their homeland, but many had chosen to stay in the land of there in Shushan and in some of the other areas. Uh, many of the Jews had chosen to stay. So that kind of sets the, that, that sets the basis for our lesson this morning. Who are the main characters of the lesson? We've already said one from the title. Who was that? Esther, yes. Esther. Who else? Mordecai. Mordecai. Very good. What was the relationship between Esther and Mordecai? He was... Okay. All right. So, uh, there was a... She had been... Weren't they cousins? Well, anyway... I, it, he was her uncle. He was... He, he was her uncle. She, and what was she? She, she, was, she was an orphan, wasn't she? And Mordecai raised uh, Esther from a little girl up to where we pick up on the lesson today. 
Who else, what, who else do we have in this story as? Haman. 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 You know that name even sounds wicked, doesn't it? <laughs> Haman. Haman. And there's one more that is significant to the whole story. The king, Ahasuerus. Yes, King Ahasuerus. Where is God in this story? He's not mentioned, but he's there, isn't he? We, we see the imprint of God written in a powerful way, through, woven throughout the entire story of Queen Esther and the Jews. Where is prayer in this lesson? Prayer. Where is prayer in this lesson? Is prayer mentioned at all in the scriptures? It's not that I'm aware of. They agree. They ask them to fast. Now, I suppose prayer is implied in that, no doubt. And I'm sure. I'm sure the people, the Jews, were not only fasting, but were praying and calling upon God in the midst of the difficulty that they faced. You're all familiar with the story of how, how the story begins, how Vashti was the queen of the king, Ahasuerus, and he had thrown a party, a big celebration, celebrating his kingdom, and had called Vashti for Vashti to come in and dance before all the officials, and she refused. I say good for her. No doubt it was intended to be a sensual, uh, exploiting her type of thing, and she refused. And, and because of her refusal to come, the king was very angry and wroth. And he decided that that was the end of her. And so she was deposed as queen. And, and uh, uh, as a result, the king had no queen. And so his, his advisors advised him to go throughout all the providence and have the young, beautiful women brought in and prepared. And then the king would choose from one of those to be his queen. And in the process of all of that, Esther was brought in along with the other ladies. And the Bible tells us that Esther found grace, much grace and favor in the eyes of, the, of those who were overseeing this process of preparing these young ladies to become, uh, to be chosen, one to be chosen by the king. Uh, one of the things that we learn in, in the early on about Esther is that she kept a secret. What was that secret? She had a secret that she brought with her. She was a Jew. She was a Jew. And she told nobody that she was... Why did she not... Why was she silent about her nationality? Mordecai, Mordecai had said, you're not to reveal your identity. They are cousins. Thank you, Brother Larry. Chapter 2, verse 7. Okay, thank, I thought they were. Yes, okay. <laughs> the word uncle is in there, and so it's so easy to kind of confuse the terms there. Thank you for, for, for clarifying that, Brother Larry. Um, but Mordecai had, had, had instructed her not to reveal her identity, but he had revealed his, that he was a Jew. He was open about being a Jew. And so when Esther was brought before the king, it was almost immediate, immediately that the king, that she found favor in the eyes of the king. And he chose her and made her the queen, uh, of, uh, the queen under the king. So Esther, in verse uh, 16 of chapter 2, we read, So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the tenth, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, and she became she then became queen. Shortly after, or sometime after Esther had become queen, a critical event occurred that sets one of the the key factors for the entire unfolding of this divine story that we have before us. Esther chapter 2 and verse 21, a critical event. And we see, while God is not mentioned, 
we see a divine, sovereign hand at work in, in the midst of, of all of these circumstances. Esther chapter 2 and verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigtham and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the, thing was made, and the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. Now mark this, because this is, this is important. And Esther certified the king, or notified the king, in whose name? In Mordecai's name. In Mordecai's name. Verse 23, and when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles of the King. At first glance, that would appear to be a, a, an insignificant event. But it underlies and, and is one of the key uh, events that underlie this story as it begins to unfold. Moving on to Esther chapter 3, we begin to, we begin to see the plot to uh, extinguish or annihilate the Jews. We see that plot beginning to unfold. Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. By the way, who was behind this plot to annihilate the Jews? Someone said Haman. Was it Haman? Satan. It was Satan, wasn't it? This was the, the one that really was behind this whole... Th Haman, what, what was Haman? What was Haman in this whole story? He was an Agagite, yes, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but but what, what, was, what was Haman? If Satan was behind this whole thing, what does... He was being used by the devil. Thank you, Brother Jeff. He was Satan's tool, his instrument, uh, his instrument to unfold this plot to annihilate the Jews. Why would Satan want the Jews annihilated? Why is this so critical to history? God's chosen people, yes, Sister Barbara? So Christ can't come. And both Christ was coming through the Jews. That was God's promise, that Christ would come through the Jews. And so God in his plan could not permit the Jews to be annihilated. They would have been if Satan, through Haman, had had his way. Esther chapter 3, the plot to extinguish the Jews, beginning with verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agag Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were above him, or that were with him. What's the significance of Haman being an Agagite? Yes. And they didn't. The story goes back to the account of Saul, doesn't it? Where God had instructed Saul, you're to utterly destroy the Amalekites. God's commands are always for our good, aren't they? And what we don't destroy that's sinful will destroy us. And now here it comes back around. Did Saul destroy the Amalekites? He spared Agag, the king, didn't he? Now Agag was killed by Samuel. But apparently there was, there was those left who survived... And now Israel is facing their destruction by this enemy that God had said you're to destroy, Agag. He is called an Agagite, which seems to denote that he was descended from the royal family of the Amalekites, the bitterest enemies of the Jews. And Agag was one of the titles of the Amalekite kings. <coughs> Moving on with verse, uh, with verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily with him, unto him, that he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai matters whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. 
And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he sought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. And, and uh, dropping down to verse 8, and Haman said unto the king, Haman had gone into the king, and Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the providences of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Did the king have any idea what was going on? He didn't, did he? Did Esther have any idea what was going on? Not yet. She was totally in the dark, and so was the king. And so the Bible goes on to tell us that word was sent out to all the governors and all the rulers of all the provinces and all those that were over all of the, the tribes or the, the, the towns throughout the entire, entire kingdom of, of Ahasuerus, from Ethiopia to India, and that on the twelfth month of the year, they were to rise up and utterly annihilate the Jews. Pretty serious stuff. Really serious stuff. Verse 15 says, The posts went out, being hastened by the king's commandment, and the decree was given in Shushan, the palace. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. city of Shushan was perplexed. Haman and the king sat down to drink. Chapter 4 of Esther. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province whithersoever the king's commandment and his degree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth, sackcloth cloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther to, for Hatchet, Hatchet, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatach went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And it goes on to say that he gave Esther a copy of, of the, the decree that was, uh, was sent out to everybody to uh, to destroy the Jews. And then he gave Esther specific instructions. What was that? What was that? Sister? To go to the king and do what? To plea for the people. Esther, you will have to go to the king and plea for your people. Was Esther open to that? 
Not a first, what did, was she? What was Esther's objection? You dare not go before the king if he hasn't called for you. If you go before the king and he hasn't called you, and he doesn't do what? Hold out his golden scepter. What happens to you? You're executed. Yes, you're executed. And the king hasn't called for me in 30 days. It's interesting to see the process of Esther's awakening. At first it was, I can't do this. But as time goes on, Esther is a sensitive, conscientious person, a self-sacrificing woman. As in, in, in a short matter of time, Esther recognizes, this is my duty, I have to do this. Why? Why? Let's, let's read what Mordecai had to say to her. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house. This is verse 13 of chapter, of chapter 4. Thou shalt escape from the, in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. God has a plan, doesn't he? God always has a plan, and we want to fit into his plan. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And with those words from Haman's firm and clear leader, or from Mordecai's firm and clear leadership, Esther was awakened. Esther was awakened, and she saw what her real position is in life, what the real purpose is in life. Remember what we said early on in the lesson this morning? The Christian life is what? We're engaged in what? We're engaged in warfare. We're engaged in warfare. The Christian life is not about our nice homes and about an easy lifestyle and all the other comforts of life and nice things that we have. Thank God for those. I'm glad for those. I appreciate those. But that's not our purpose. Our duty our purpose here is to engage in this warfare with God's power, through God's power and provision for the souls of men and the good of other people. Esther's awakening. Verse 15. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. What a woman. What a woman of character. She wasn't asking them to just all go out there and fast for three days and three nights. Oh, no. She was joining them. The queen. That's leadership. That's leadership. Joining them. The queen. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And, will, uh, and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Then we, we move into chapter 5 of the book of Esther. The plan engaged. The plan engaged. The plan that Esther and Mordecai agreed on to go into the king engaged. But at the same time, the forces of evil accelerate. The forces of evil are ramping it up. We can't let this go by. We've got to win. Esther chapter 5 and verse 1. And you know, I, I, this really speaks to my heart. One fragile human being. One fragile human being. And I, we're all fragile this morning. One fragile human being that's willing to take the duty seriously and step out by faith, risking all, everything, even their life, is used mightily of God. He doesn't need our strength. He just needs our cooperation. One fragile human being rising against the determined forces of hell and engaged in God's plan. Verse 1 of chapter 
5 of Esther. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in his royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, I suppose you could hear a pin drop. Here comes Esther, unbidden by the king. And I can imagine his, the look on his face. Here she stands before him, knowing that her life is at stake. And the king saw her, and uh, verse 2, And so it was when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. We see the, the, a divine sovereign hand at work here. She obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, wilt thou queen Esther, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good to, unto the king and Haman, come this day unto a banquet that I have prepared for him. And the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. We don't have time this morning, but do you notice how Esther is flowing with God's timing throughout this entire account? She could have begged for her life right there. She could have begged for the Jews' life right there, but no. Esther was giving God the time to set things up and bring it all together. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet, this is, the, this is that very same day, and the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, what is thy petition? It shall be granted thee. What is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, and again, giving God time, flowing with God's timetable. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. I will reveal my request as you are asking me tomorrow at the banquet. Moving on to verse 9, we see Haman's vile, selfish, egotistical boastings. We see evil vaunted. We see evil celebrating self. Then went Haman forth that day, joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself when he came home, and he sat and called for his friends, and Zareth, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory. Doesn't this make you sick? You almost feel like you want to puke, you know, <laughs> with, 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 with what this man is so full of himself. The wickedness, the vileness of this man. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above all the princes and the servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in, to, uh, in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared for, but myself. And, to, and tomorrow I am invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the gate. Now another plot is hatched, this time against who? Against who? Haman. Haman hatches it, but who's the plot against? Mordecai. Against Mordecai, verse 14. Then said Zeresh, his wife and all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. The die was set. The die was cast. He caused the gallows to be set, and tomorrow... Mordecai is going to hang on those gallows. Really? Really? Let's go on. Esther chapter 6. And here we see God's intervention and a divine hand of power that just at the right moment, 
just at the right time, flashes forward in power and begins to bring about deliverance to the Jews. Esther chapter 6, God's sovereign power hand becomes visible. Verse 1, on that night could not the king sleep. Why? Why? God has the simplest of ways, doesn't he? He has the simplest of ways of bringing his purposes to pass. Could not the king sleep? And he commanded to bring a, the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were all read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigathena and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. You remember at the beginning of this, of this whole thing was the plot to kill the king and how God had, had injected that or how that was injected into it to bring this whole thing to pass. Verse 3, And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants and ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Verse 4, And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the court, outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Just at this very time walks in Haman to make this request to the king to hang Mordecai. Talk about divine timing. How close can you get? Man could never do such a thing. Never. But God was unfolding his plan, his purpose. Praise the Lord. Let's go on. Evil intent confounded and humiliated. And the king said, Who is in the court? And Haman was in the court. Verse 5, And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, What did he think in his heart? Who else could it be but me? I think God has a sense of humor, you know what? He was just, God is, and Haman answered the king, the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king uses to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the royal crown which is set upon his head. And you know the story, we're running out of time, how that, 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 Someone was to take that man throughout the streets and cry out, this is the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And, he, and King Ahasuerus thought that was a wonderful plan. And so he said to Haman, what did he say to Haman? You do it. You take Mordecai and put him, dress him up in the royal apparel with the crown and put him on the royal horse and take him through the streets and declare and shout out, this is the man whom the king delighteth to honor. God is at work. And you know, God still works today if we'll just keep our hands off and just fit into his plan and, and flow with the story that God is telling today in our generation. God will work through you and I in ways like this. It may not be in politics or in, in the upper levels of, of high things, but in the everyday simple examples, simple situations of life that you and I are involved in, God will work this way. Well, uh, verse 13, and Haman, after it was all done, Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. He was humiliated, verse 14. And while they were yet talking with him, the king's chamberlains haste to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Chapter 7 of Esther, the plot uncovered. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with, queen Esther, with Esther the queen. And the king said unto Esther, on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted unto thee. What is thy request? And it shall be performed, even to the half of the kingdom. Then, queen, then Esther the queen answered and said, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, and I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen 
and bondwomen or as servants, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could not, have, could not countervail the king's da damage or make up for the lost revenues or taxes that, that, through the loss of, of these Jews. Verse 5, Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he that doth presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Evil now is not only being confronted, evil is being uncovered. And the plot is revealed. Amen. Then King Ahasuerus, verse 5, answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen. 